When I graduated college from engineering, I was definitely pretty disillusioned as to what I was going to get myself into. I had big expectations of making a nice salary, potentially six figures, the ability to kind of coast low key and not have to work so hard because engineering school was so tough. And I just felt like it was going to be a lot easier than whatever school was. To my dismay, that didn't happen. What's going on, Markel here. And today I wanna to talk about what people don't tell you when you're pursuing engineering going into your career. Career advice is one piece, but I think another piece is just setting expectations overall. Going from school to work, even if you've interned, is not the same thing as going from like school to work full time. I was pretty disillusioned and I thought I'd take a moment to share some of the big things that I've learned, big mistakes, big discoveries to help you. So if you're a senior or a junior in college preparing for what that path ahead looks like, or if you're younger and you're just curious what it looks like, I, I can kind of break some of those, those myths. And if you're working full time already, maybe you've experienced this. And so if you have, um, throw your thoughts down in the comments, let me know what you think. And if you're new here, I invite you to subscribe. I'm making content about career tech and mindset. Those are really just things that I'm really interested in. And I've had some really cool experiences and I just want to share parts of my journey with you in order to help you on your journey. So the first thing no one ever told me is that your engineering career would not be easier than your engineering education. Makes sense, but I don't know why I thought otherwise. It could be different depending on what industry you go in, but if you studied to get a undergraduate in any engineering discipline, it was just a generic kind of, I know this space of engineering at a basic level. So I'm an electrical engineer, and I would say after four or five years at Purdue, I have a pretty mediocre understanding of electrical engineering because it's just such a vast industry. It's like pretty hard, especially with the current curriculum, to be able to say after a few years that you really know what you're doing. So you're going to be a generalist and you have to find what your specialty is. When I first started working at Tesla, it was like drinking water from a fire hose. There was so much new information from the jargon to understanding the like expectations to some of the technical details that we had to deal with like on a daily basis. The only time I ever felt like I knew what I was doing or I was like, doing good was during an interview, I was asked by what would end up being my like technical lead. You know, if you have two resistors in parallel and they are 120 ohms each, what is the equivalent resistance? And I was like, yo, if this is what work is gonna be like, I got this. And obviously it's 60 ohms. And that's that was the easiest problem he could have ever asked in an interview. It was a lot harder than that when I started on day one. I thought that in school, I would work really, really hard. And the all-nighters that I pulled, the, the really long study sessions, either solo or with friends or peers, I thought that was like behind me when I graduated till I had a really difficult technical issue at work that actually required me to pull an all-nighter. And that was really tough. We stayed up because we had to talk to China on the phone to basically coordinate the change in the part. And I never thought I would have to pull an all-nighter for work. Granted, I probably didn't have to, but the urgency of the project kind of pushed me or nudged me to go the extra mile to make it happen. I thought I would spend less time working than I did when I was actually studying for new material at school. Not only that, I spent a good amount of time just trying to understand the technical jargon and some of the technical elements of our designs because I was just so new at it. There were engineers who had already worked in automotive and engineers who just knew um, about the space already from working on similar projects, whether it was like a Formula SAE or like a Baja type team, but I didn't have those experiences. So I ended up spending a good amount of time after work hours, but still at work, trying to understand these things. And that included reading specs, reading papers, and just trying to like read PowerPoint presentations on like what we're doing and what we're building. And again, I thought I was low key. I thought I was done learning, but I was really just beginning. Another surprise came when I got called into work on a weekend, like on a Saturday. 
And then sometimes I had to work on a Sunday. Again, it depends on how critical the issue is, how big the issue is, and if you are who they deem the best person to solve it. So there's like a double-edged sword here because you kind of want to be that person that they lean on and who who are they? They're the ones who probably approve you for a promotion or getting some type of like stock grant or something like that. So you kind of don't want to rub them the wrong way. You want to make sure you're on their, their good side. If I would get called in by my director, it's like, okay, I'm working on Saturday morning. This didn't happen often. And a lot of companies have different cultures when it comes to this. I would say if your company is like really trying to achieve high excellence, you're going to have these really abnormal conditions of like, hey, you got to work um, kind of off of the clock or around the clock. Let's go with around the clock. That's part of it. And so I didn't anticipate that. I thought it was like, I thought it was kind of like a clock in clock out situation because that's how an internship felt. You know, you go into your internship, you kind of start at nine or eight and you leave at 530. You did your time. You feel good on the weekends. You don't think about work. But when you're full time, everything changes, especially if you own a part, even though it was like super tough and I honestly didn't anticipate just how hard it was going to be. I tried to face all of those challenges head on. So in the first case, I didn't know the jargon. So I stayed and did what I needed to do in order to feel more confident and just be able to add value within the organization, within the company. Um, the second piece, as far as like dealing with management's expectations, if you do what your manager says, you should do, you're actually in a great position, especially if it's documented. It's like, hey, I did this thing for you. I deserve compensation. I deserve a raise, whatever it is. And then they're like, you did do those things at AGS. And that creates reliability for you as the individual contributor. The last piece was really just like diving into problems. You know, whether it's working late or coming in on a weekend, in my opinion, if you see a problem that needs to be solved, a great engineer will dive into that problem and find a solution or understand what the root cause is and bring people together to drive forward a solution as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, um, and just at a quality level. All to say, it doesn't get easier than school, but it's definitely super rewarding because with it, you actually get to ship a product or you actually get to build something, create something that is used instead of just something like a school project that kind of sits there dormant or collects dust or no one really cares about it. So the problems that you solve are super fulfilling. Related to the first kind of misconception that it gets easier um, once you're done with school is also the misconception of like what got you there is what's gonna keep you there. Like I said earlier, if you studied engineering and you just got a bachelor's degree, you're pretty much just a generalist. You may, be, may have dove into a little bit of a specialty, but you're not a specialist in any sense, not yet because you just haven't had enough projects or experiences to be able to really say with conviction that you're an expert in something. It was a big wake up call when I realized that a lot of my schoolwork and no shade to any schools in particular, when my schoolwork didn't relate at all to the work that I was doing on the job. And that sucked. Everything that I did to get there wasn't gonna keep me there because whatever got me there was kind of irrelevant. and. Not that it was irrelevant in and of itself, but it just wasn't relevant anymore. Now I needed to learn an entirely different space, founded on the same principles, right, of physics and everything, but I had to learn a whole new suite of skills, a whole new suite of programs and software to be able to be effective in this new environment. And so like, there's really two pieces. So I mentioned earlier how I would learn on the job. I would stay after hours and just read documents, read papers, read presentations in order to just feel more confident and just be able to keep up in meetings, to be honest. But not only that, I also had to learn outside of work. That meant maybe finding something on YouTube to, to watch outside on the weekends, just to just continue to brush up on my skills and knowledge, or maybe taking some type of course on Udemy um, or Coursera or even Khan Academy and learn about different principles that I may not have fully understood or would kind of go over my head if, if I was in a room with like executives or something. A friend really told me this and 
this expression, which was like, what gets you in the door isn't what keeps you in the door. Honestly, you're selling yourself this kind of projective version of yourself. Like your resume is just saying like, I am worthy to get an interview. And during the interview, you're saying, I am worthy to get a job. And then you get the job and you're like, I'm worthy to stay here or get promoted. You're trying to sell this version of yourself to get to the next space, but whatever you did to sell yourself in that previous space isn't what's gonna be able to maintain or sustain you in the existing space. If you were only as smart or capable as you were in the interviews, that probably wouldn't be sufficient if you were like six months into the job, right? The interviews got you here, but they're not gonna be what keeps you in that position. And I don't think that with this, you have to become like autodidactic. You don't have to like teach yourself everything. In addition, you can make sure that you surround yourself with either peers or mentors. A peer being someone that's close to your seniority level that you can learn from. And then a mentor is just someone who you can essentially lean on and say like, yo, I don't understand this. What does this mean? And I made sure I had both because you can ask different questions to different people. I had a coworker who we started like three weeks apart and we were working on this software and we both didn't know how it worked and we're just and we're just clicking around. And I remember like clicking, trying to figure out if we're getting the the controller to communicate. I looked over at him and was like, do you know what you're doing? He was like, I have no idea. And at that point I was like, okay, I'm not the only one. We're all kind of in this together trying to figure it out. If you're kind of vulnerable and you kind of say like, hey, we're both trying to learn this thing instead of everyone acting like they're smarter than everyone else, it makes it a lot easier to collaborate. And another piece of disillusionment that I came across was how much engineering work I would actually do. In the beginning, it was definitely closer to 50, 60% of my time. And that would consist of me reviewing drawings, schematics, um, working to debug parts, and really like hands-on, on the ground type of work. And as I kind of grew in my experience and kind of got a couple of promotions, I realized that I was spending less time actually engineering and a whole lot more time in meetings. And most of the meetings were trying to figure out what the engineering work I should be doing is. For example, I remember one time I was designing a board, a PCB. We were trying to determine what resistor I needed for this board. There's a few properties of a resistor and the one that we were trying to determine was the temperature coefficient. The temperature coefficient is correlated to how much the nominal resistance value will deviate over a range of temperatures. And so my job was to figure out if we put different resistors and we tried to measure like the equivalent resistance over a huge span of temperatures, does it still perform the way we expect? And while I could simulate it, it was better to actually run some physical tests. And so I ended up running some chamber tests, collecting a bunch of data and then reporting back and saying like, I think I should use this resistor or maybe I should use this one. And then after like two, three weeks, it was determined like this is the best resistor to use. I go onto the software, it was called Altium, and I just go on there and in like three seconds, I like click, click, drag the resistor that I wanted, drop it in, that was it. And then I was like, off to the next thing. So it was really funny because we learn how to use these software tools, but such a small percentage of time is actually spent on them. There's so much more time spent figuring out what you should do on those tools. and. Granted, I'd say this does vary from maybe like a mechanical engineer who uses their CAD software as like the one source of truth every single day. But as an electrical engineer, I may not have to reference my design every single day. Depending on where we are in a project, it actually may make more sense to deal with a physical product instead of trying to reference the schematic anyway. My tip here, if you're spending less time doing your core engineering and more time meeting, is to embrace it if that's what you want. And really you're kind of going down two different paths, right? Where if you're an individual contributor, which is the person who is responsible and essentially has no direct reports, they're not a manager, your job is to execute some function or drive some deliverable told by your manager. If you start going into meetings, that may be a sign that you're starting to have to delegate more because unless you're like really, really good, it's gonna be hard to balance having so many meetings and executing all of the technical aspects. Again, people have to do it, I've had to do it. I think it's really a, a point where you are getting challenged to see what are you gonna do 
when you have like a greater scope of responsibility. Last thing I'd say is I made this to give a little bit more perspective on what the day to day could look like or some of the challenges that you would face once you start your engineering role um, or your engineering or your tech career. But I know I've missed out on things, but if you guys have any specific questions about what I just shared today, let me know. Um, and also appreciate you guys for staying to the end. If you like zoom to this part and just watch this part, that's fine too. But if you did watch the whole thing, I appreciate it. Feel free to subscribe, like, comment. Let me know what else you'd like to see. I'm trying to just make more of these and just share as much about my experience as I can. So if you found this useful, let me know. And hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Have a dope day. Peace.